BF Skin. A series of human behavior drawn from years of laboratory experiments with rats and pigeons have aroused a storm of protest from humanists, from Freudians, and from all those who cannot accept the Skinner thesis that man's behavior is controlled by his external environment and not from an inner man. In his novel, Walden II, and later in his book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, he described an ideal society in which the myth of individual freedom was forgotten and man was controlled for his own good. The books were alternately praised and denounced, their author adored as a messiah and abhorred as a menace. One of the most important applications of his theory of human behavior has been his own invention of the teaching machine, which he feels can revolutionize education. At Harvard, where he is virtually an institution in his own right, B.F. Skinner is the Edgar Pierce Professor of Psychology. Dr. Skinner, would you choose, if you could, to live in the kind of utopian world that you described in Walden II and in Beyond Freedom and Dignity? Oh, I would. I think uh, I certainly would. Many people thought I wrote Walden II with a tongue in cheek, but not at all. I'm, I'm sure I would, I would love it there. I'm not quite sure how to produce it. Uh, what would you um, have loved about it? I would like the personal freedom to do as I please. The, the feeling that I was carrying my weight, uh, doing my share of all of the tasks which are needed to make a community work, and not simply sitting back and letting someone else do the dirty work and so on. You can split the dirty work up and it comes to a very few minutes per day for everyone, you know. But it, it, perhaps it's misunderstood as a controlled society that someone is controlling things, someone is making decisions on your behalf about the environment in which you live. Are they there's, no, there's no current control at all except by the culture itself. People, people feel there must be a person in control, but the, that's a whole difficulty about trying to, to understand that people are not governed by other people except in very rare cases cases. They are governed by the world in which they live, what other people think of them in the mass. What we do during the day is not controlled by a policeman or by a priest or by a teacher or by a psychotherapist, except in rather rare cases. In general, we're controlled by what people in general do when we respond. And it's the culture as a whole that's controlling us, and that will continue to be the case in an improved culture. We can do this in such a way that uh, we will be much uh, better off and be much more effective than we are now. So that in this utopian culture that, that you described, uh, the, the goals, so to speak, the values would be set by common agreement rather than by some person in charge or a group of people in charge, an elite? Not in the sense of consensus or common agreement as, as, as a decision-making kind of thing. They will be set by what works out best as cultures evolve. It's an evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. We work out better ways of doing things and we accept them when they are better because they, they are more effective. Better ways of producing the goods we need, better ways of getting along with each other and so on, better ways of teaching. And we, we don't need to quibble about what we mean by better there. We, we know we can agree on that mm -hmm. fairly, fairly readily. That is what slowly produces a workable pattern. Now it can be done by design, and in the case of Walden II it was. Someone just said, this is the way we're going to try it out. But it was experimental even so. This was, we'll try it this way, and if it doesn't work, we'll change. People keep saying to me, you didn't say, in, in Beyond Freedom of Dignity, you didn't say who was to control. Well, there's no who, there's no man going to emerge as a ruler. It's going to be a different type of world, and that world will be what is in control. But you said that the thing that you would enjoy about it personally would be Freedom. Oh, yes. And yet, beyond freedom, suggests ah, in the, oh, yes, in the no, title itself no, that it's look, beyond if I, freedom. If I had written a book, Beyond the Wide Missouri, would you think <laughs> I was in favor of damming up the Missouri River or something like that? I'm not down on freedom or mm -hmm. dignity. I want to redefine them. I'm, mm -hmm. Freedom, I mean by that, freedom from punitive sanctions, from, from kinds of control that we escape from if we can. We have escaped mm -hmm. from many of them, but 
by no means all, alas. No, I'm in favor of the feeling of freedom. You feel free when you are doing what you want to do, and you do what you want to do when you are working for positive results. You have to do what you, what you do to escape from unpleasantnesses, and that's what we get away from if we can, and that is what the struggle of freedom has been about. No, I want people to feel freer than they've ever felt before, and I want to feel free. And I want people to be more achieving than they've ever felt before and have, any, have a greater sense of worth. And they can if they just uh, solve the problem presented to them by the world in which they live and how to improve that so they can be more achieving, more creative, more productive. So you have no doubt that you could have achieved what you have achieved in this kind of society in a utopian society where you were free to do it? Well, I don't know what leads a person to be achieving in a given case. And I, uh, at the moment, I'm working on an autobiography and going back and trying to find out what happened to me as a mm -hmm. person. And I can't find anything. I, I can't get the Freudian kind of thing. I, don't, I can't trace any origins, really, in my past. I don't believe there were any very important influences on me. There were thousands of little influences. Accidentally, they all came together to produce something that, uh, that, I, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with. But I don't believe I could trace that, and I don't think anyone can go very far in that direction. So that to say that I would have been the person I am today if I'd grown up in World War II, that doesn't follow, not by any means. Mm -hmm. I, would have, I think I would have, would have done things I wanted to do, things I would be proud of having done. Yes, I can say that. Well, so frequently in our conversation with guests, what they have achieved seems almost to have been motivated by their reaction to an unhappy childhood in some yes, cases. Yes, I don't see a bit of that in my own past. Yeah. I don't, I see nothing but But you would accident. eliminate that, I, I would you I see accident not? after mm -hmm. accident. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I've published a little article about my research. Almost every discovery I ever made was an accident. Now, the only thing I can claim was the Pasteur's famous uh, dictum that chance favors a prepared spirit. Well, I was prepared for good results. I was very happy when they fell my way. And I latched onto them and I made as much as I could of them. So it's not only but a matter of luck, them. but a matter of recognizing it I when didn't it comes along. Them. It's not, I was not there as a creative person. I was there as a selective creative person, but not as a producing creative mm -hmm. person. Well, creativity itself seems to so often, not always, but so often derive from uh, unhappiness, adversity. Oh, nonsense. It is it nonsense. Does, well, it has done that, of course. Yeah. It has done that. But it can do it. It can work in other ways. I, don't, I can't imagine that Bach was a very unhappy person. He had 19 children. He could hardly have been frustrated sexually. Mm -hmm. And he did put the great, great works. And he was just charmed by his medium, and the sheer delight. Mm -hmm. Of working with a medium. It doesn't come from any deep craving inside of some sort. Now, this is what the analysts have put over on us. It's a lot of nonsense, I mm. think. Of course, Dostoevsky is not a matter. He was a God tormented man, a man who felt guilty, uh, terribly guilty, and he wrote out of that guilt. But then somebody else could write out of sheer happiness. Mm. What about Mozart, who wrote his first symphony at six? Was he a product of his environment, too? Oh, I'm sure he was. I, I suppose there was a good deal of parental discipline there, and uh, he, may, he may very well have been an unhappy person if uh, Papa was standing by with a birch rod or something. I'm not sure of the details there, <laughs> but I have the impression that he, he ground these things out uh, very often because uh, somebody had a, had a cocktail party or a tea party and uh, needed the new sonata, and mm -hmm. so he di dished one up for them. But if I understand you, you do not believe that there is any innate thing in man, that, uh, that, that is an inner man. Uh, that, there, is no, that there is no creative man in advance. Now, the, the mm. parallel with evolution is extremely interesting here. Before Darwin, it was supposed that uh, the diversity of species on the surface of the earth was due to a creative mind, spelled with a capital M. Mm -hmm. It was an act of creation. It was the creation, was the thing, you see. The, 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 the Bible talked about the creation. And that produced uh, all the animals, which, of which we now know there are at least 10 million different ones on the surface of the earth. With Darwin, it turned around. The creation came afterward. The, the origin was uh, random. Mm -hmm. The creation was in the selective effect on the environment, by the environment, by the environment. selecting mm -hmm. those things which worked. Mm -hmm. And Darwin moves creativity from before the fact to after the fact. He moves purpose from before 
to after. It moves plan from before mm -hmm. to after, you see. And the same thing is true in what I call operant behavior. You are, your behavior is selected by its consequences. You don't design can it in you, advance. Can now, you, you give can. an example of that, uh, operant behavior? Well, you, well, what we're doing all the time, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're engaging in operant behavior now. Well, I'm, I'm making some noises and you're responding to them. And uh, if I'm successful, if I get that nod from you, I'll go on the same line. <laughs> if I get this, I'll change and so mm -hmm. on. It's, mm -hmm. it's what's happening after I behave. Mm -hmm. Verbal behavior is very hard to analyze, of course, in, the, in these terms, but it can be done, I think. But in everyday life, well, we do the things which pay off, and we tend not to do the things that don't pay off. Mm -hmm. And our behavior is shaped. Now, Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, the word origin is the main thing there, the origination of novelty. And behavior originates. We, we can handle the creativity perfectly well in this formulation. Mm -hmm. and it, but it's the, it is the origination that comes from the selective action, the artist dabbing paint on a canvas, and he, he does it possibly at random, it possibly just throws it. And if it's, if it's good, he selects it and hangs it on the wall. If it's bad, he scrapes it off and throws again. Mm -hmm. you know, see, it's a selection of the, of the beautiful thing, the reinforcing thing, the rewarding thing, which is responsible for the creative work. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you about uh, positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, your studies have shown that if an act is rewarded, it'll be repeated, yeah. whereas if it's punished, it doesn't have the same constructive effect. No. What about your own childhood? Now that you're writing your autobiography, were you punished as a child? Or very, were you rewarded? very rarely in any kind of physical way. Uh, but uh, I was certainly very sensitive to my parents' censure. And uh, if, if they were displeased, I knew it. And I was, I was, I was, I was, that was important. But the things I did during the day had nothing to do with whether my parents were approving or disapproving. I think I enjoyed them. I had all sorts of things to do. Mm -hmm. Fantastic variety of things. I, I built things. I played games. I rambled through beautiful wooded countryside and so on. Uh, this is the kind of thing it was. You apparently were very skillful at mechanical things as well. Well, I, I just grew into that because I happened to have uh, grown up with a, with a, a, a a work table and some tools in the back shed, that's mm -hmm. all. They, well, you just start building things. Before long, you're building everything you need. Mm -hmm. One accident in your life apparently led you into writing. Yes. Well, uh, I, I started writing very early, and some of the things that I've dug out now that I wrote, I published, I published a poem when I was 10 years old. And uh, it's going to take a great deal of courage to put that in the biography. It's a pretty awful thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I did write early, I, and I had a printing press, and I liked to print the stuff up. The very physical act of printing what I had written was important. It was very slow on the press, so I went over to my father's old discarded typewriter before long. But the production of writing, that kind of thing, was very important. But I, I wrote more and more, and when I got to college, I went on, and then I had had the luck to meet Robert Frost. And uh, he, we had lunch together actually, and he asked me to send him some of my stuff. And I sent him three short stories at the beginning of my senior year. Well, in the spring of my senior year, I got this very favorable letter from him. It was just published in the uh, letters of Robert Frost, although the Mr. Skinner had not identified because Lawrence Thompson got the letter from a copy in the library, I think it was at Amherst, and didn't identify uh, the Mr. Skinner, and he couldn't find it, uh, find me on any <laughs> of Frost's uh, student lists. Anyway, that confirmed my belief I should become a writer, and so I, uh, when I graduated, I took a year off to write, and it was a disaster. What I, happened? I had nothing to say. Nothing, I, I knew how to write, but I couldn't, I had nothing to say, and uh, fortunately, I, I gave up in time before I suffered too much from that, and uh, so I decided I wanted to go into science, and the only mm -hmm. science that seemed to be uh, suitable to me with my poor preparation was psychology. So I became a <laughs> psychologist. <laughs> what interested you in animal behavior? Did you grow up with animal pets as well oh, as we had, tools? Oh, uh, we had not very many pets as such, but I used to catch very turtles and snakes mm -hmm. and chipmunks and so on. And I did see at one time a, a pigeon act at a, at a state fair, a county mm -hmm. fair. It was quite interesting, in which... Um, Pigeons, there was a little facade of a building and a pigeon looking out a window and then fire started and smoke came out and there was a bell ringing and the, 
and some pigeons pulled the fire engine out with some fire en fire pigeons on it, and one of them went up a ladder and brought this uh, other pigeon down. But I don't know whether that's one of the reasons I've specialized in pigeon behavior or not, but it probably had an influence. It showed me that something could be done with pigeons, mm -hmm. certainly. And curiously, you, I suppose, became famous, at least among some people, as the man who taught pigeons to play ping pong, which you did yes, years well, ago, as a matter well, of fact. Well, that was a demonstration experiment in a class. It was not an experiment, really. It was a, dem mm -hmm. a demonstration. It was fun. It was very interesting. What did it show? Well, I was at that time, mm -hmm. uh, that time the department had split off from social relations and we were needling each other. Mm -hmm. So I set up uh, two synthetic social relations. One was competition, and that was playing ping pong, and one was cooperation, in which two pigeons had to do a very precise act at precisely the same time. And uh, all it showed was that uh, with very careful programming, you could teach uh, pigeons to do a very complicated thing. Very difficult for a pigeon to peck a ping pong ball because it looked like an egg and mm -hmm. pigeons wouldn't have survived very long if they were disposed to peck at eggs. Yes. So you had to fight that uh, particular bit of instinct. As a matter of fact, during the war you took up another experiment with pigeons that was quite serious in missile guidance, didn't oh, you? Oh yes, yes. We, uh, I have in my basement the only nose, I think, that's still existing of, uh, of America's only missile at the time. It was, a, it was called the Pelican because it's, it had so much equipment in it to guide it that there was no room for explosives. <laughs> And they used that old limerick about the beak can hold more than his belly can. You remember the, oh, the yes, pelican? Oh, yes, yes. But I, we had three pigeons in the, in the beak of the pelican, and uh, they could guide the missile. There's no question about it. Uh, How could they guide a missile? Well, they, the, there were lenses in the nose, and uh, the lenses threw the target image on screen, four-inch screens. The pigeons were in jackets behind the screens, and they were pecking at the target. If you were coming down to the ship at sea, for example, the ship would be in the middle of the field, and the pigeon, all three pigeons would be pecking at the picture of the, of, the, of the ship. Now, if the target started to go off, that image would move to the side, and the pigeon would move to the side, and that would send a signal back to the servo mechanism and correct the, the flight. Didn't you have the Humane Society on your neck? Well, what is done to pigeons uh, in a park uh, is far more cruel than what would have happened in this case, because they would never have known what hit them when, uh, when they blew up. <laughs> you, uh, one of your principles, of course, is that, and you uh, made allusion to this earlier, that man is not autonomous. He's not truly no. free. Yes. And of course, all humanists believe that man is autonomous. Yes, oh yes, they want credit. So that, uh, you mean, the man, the, the, they want credit for themselves, for what they want achieved. to feel that they are, are responsible for their actions. They are doing things. They deserve mm -hmm. to be patted on the back. and. Uh, that their action is due to them. That means that what you've achieved is not due to you. No, it's due to my history, my genetic endowment the first, in the first place, and what has happened to that genetic endowment uh, through the years that I've lived. I don't believe I have originated anything except be, uh, as, a, as a system which has selected and adjusted and adapted and become productive in a particular way. Ought you not to be rewarded for what you've achieved or what, oh, I, what I insist your environment it. has I achieved? Insist, you do. I insist, but of course that's, I want everybody to be rewarded. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's my line. I want everyone to be rewarded and not punished. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about the applications of your theories. One, of course, that is most well known to us is the teaching machine. How did yes. that come about? Well, these were, the teaching machine is not an important thing in itself. It's, uh, there are machines which are being used and computers are being used as teaching machines. The whole thing there is to analyze the conditions under which a pupil learns, a student learns, and to facilitate learning by improving the conditions. And a good deal of that can be done with devices of one kind or another. That's what, mach what teaching machines are. How do you respond to your critics who say that a teaching machine simply teaches by a rote system uh, subject well, but doesn't uh, teach the process. I, I respond of by asking them to look at the teaching machine. It doesn't mm -hmm. do any such thing. Mm -hmm. There's no rote. Rote means going over, over and mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Drill meant that too, you know. Yes. A drill is a, like a drill. You mm -hmm. drill a hole by going around and around and around. Uh, no, there's not, no repetition in, uh, in teaching machine material. Program instruction avoids any kind of rote. What about the application of behaviorism to child rearing? How do you feel about the way in which children should be Weird. Obviously, well, you don't I feel they're they very should badly weird now. They are? Uh, certainly. I don't feel that I did a very good job, although my two daughters are very charming and uh, intelligent and productive people. But um, 
the, I don't think anyone knows exactly how to raise children. Not enough has been done uh, on it. But I know we do and know. it's unscientific? That, well, we do know that what's being done wrong. Mm -hmm. That's quite clear. I think the first five or six years are the great wasted years in American life. We, we turn uh, the child over to a busy uh, mother who doesn't quite understand this thing, and all sorts of mistakes are made. It could, could be done much more effectively, and is being done more effectively. There are, are very good uh, materials being prepared now and books being written that should make very effective child care possible if anyone uh, is interested in that. Uh, would this rule out punishment? Oh, children? I would think, I would believe that it could eventually completely rule out the use of punishment. I think at the present time there are some serious conditions where you might justify a mild use of mild punishment. But even so, we know better how to use punishment so that it doesn't become vicious and so on. I would prefer not to use any at all. As a matter of fact, uh, didn't with my, with my own children. With, with your younger daughter, a good, good deal of attention was given to the fact that she was raised in the first few months of her life, first year of her first life, I guess. First two and a half years. First yes. two and a half so years in a controlled crib. environment, yes. an air crib. Whatever became, what became of the idea well, of an air crib? Oh, those are still in use, mm -hmm. and hundreds, oh, thousands of children have been raised in them. My two granddaughters have been raised in them. Do they show um, any difference over other oh, children? I don't think you can tell by any, no, nobody's made a survey of them, and well, one, in one case or a few cases don't, don't prove anything, but they're, they're remarkable, I think, for, for making it possible to give a child very good care. Um, many people misunderstand it. They think you put the baby in and close it up and come back a year later. But uh, it's only used as a crib is used, of course. And uh, it's, it's a marvelous environment for the baby. And it's very, very It doesn't shut the baby off from the mother's well, affection and all quite, the other quite, things that we think are so contrary. important. Uh -huh. Quite the contrary, because it makes it so easy to take care of a baby that the mother's love just pours out. That, uh, Why hasn't it caught on? Well, it has, except it's very difficult to, to, uh, to get them. People make their own. Uh, mm -hmm. they, it's very hard to, American, American business, you know, is not enterprising, really. It will, it will if people have proved that Refrigerators are good things, and everybody will manufacture refrigerators, but uh, it will not take a new product. That happened with a teaching machine. You can't mm -hmm. go out and make, get a market analysis to prove that people want these, so you can't convince the board of directors it's worth putting a million dollars into a production line. And without a production line, you can't produce mm -hmm. things cheaply. But it will come eventually, because it's no question, it's, it's valuable. All sorts of rumors, of course, have spread about that daughter. Yes. <laughs> she killed herself and became psychotic and so on. And none of her, these things her, happened. Her, her, her friends yeah. have taken courses and discovered that she had become psychotic. Yeah. So I think it bothered her for a while, but uh, you know, we laugh it off now. Mm. Uh, does the philosophy of behaviorism impinge upon the world's cosmic problems? Pollution? Oh, of course it does. Population um, control? War? Of course it does. The main question is, why aren't we doing something more effective about it, you see? What we're doing is not effective, obviously. Oh, it certainly is not. Yeah. And it's not because we uh, have not solved this problem of freedom. You see, we, we do need some planning. We need, do need some designing. And we're so scared of who is going to control that we don't uh, allow ourselves to use common sense to take care of the future. Mm -hmm. We can look ahead to what is going to be needed and do something about it. But right away, people will rise up and say, I don't want anybody meddling in my life. I want to be able to build something where I want to build and You can do this, I presume, by positive reinforcements of some sort, by designing an environment of positive reinforcements? Yes, but you've got to get control of the people who have control of the environments, for I example. See. You mentioned Walden, too. There are very few places in America where you could build the, the simple buildings in Walden, mm -hmm. too, now, because the zoning for multiple dwellings is, is so acute that you, you, you can't find find land where you'd be allowed to put that kind of building up. It's been established that in America people will live in single families with half an acre at most and mm -hmm. uh, so many bedrooms and only one family related uh, living in it and you can't even you can't even take a you can't find a house in Cambridge and move two or three unrelated people into it. Uh, that's illegal. I saw somewhere where you had suggested that we might pay school dropouts to go to school isn't education its own reward? Isn't that a positive reinforcement? It is, it is when uh, you get the student at the point where he, it becomes positive reinforcing. But to begin with, you need very conspicuous reinforcers. Mm. In New York, schools are half empty now. You know, the students are all playing truant, and uh, not, nobody's doing anything about it. They can't do anything about it. Well, uh, these people are going to be on, they're going to grow up. They're going to have an uneducated 
uh, population there of vast proportions. Now, you can save money now instead of welfare and uh, crime prevention later by getting those people to go back to school. And you could do it perfectly well if you uh, had spent some more money to make schools more attractive and certainly to teach the kinds of things mm -hmm. which they can learn. It's, a, it's a very much a question of, 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 of doing the kinds of things that, that, that people can do. It's absurd to ask somebody to study Shakespeare in high school if he hasn't learned to read in grade school. Mm -hmm. And yet we can, and this has been proved, take the, the kids who have been called unteachable and teach them to read at one and a half times a normal rate. How do you spend your time now? You're not well, teaching I, as much. I would like to spend my time just uh, sitting and thinking and writing books, but I get pulled into all sorts of avenues. Uh, uh, there are practical problems that come up, issues that arise. I feel I should have something to do with and take an interest in and, and speak about. So I, I am drawn uh, away from the, the ivory tower, and unfortunately, I can't get all the time I want. Is it not so that much of your time is taken up with either the extension of or the defense of the original work you have done, thereby keeping you from doing more original work? Yes, that's, that is it. And of course, the trouble there is that's all part of my past, and hence, uh, it's not my future, and I still want to work on my future. And in going back to defend the past, I have to re relive the past, but uh, I would prefer to spend all my time on what I still have to do. Is there no way you can close out the world, so to speak, and uh, <laughs> regain well, your privacy? Well, if I were just rude and could turn people away and not answer letters and so on, I suppose it's possible, but I, I haven't got to that point yet. Do you hope that more work is yet to be done? Oh, much more. And very young, lots of very fine young people are doing it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.